Almost like you guys were not expecting me to be out. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know right? You know, as we go into 2023, you know, it's gonna do things a little different. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I just have a couple of things at the top and we'll get started. Today on the 81st anniversary of Pearl Harbor, the president met with a group of 23 World War II veterans, family members, and volunteers, and thanked them for their service. The veterans traveled to DC on an honor flight from Austin, Texas to attend the Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day observance at the World War II Memorial on the National Mall. These veterans served on the home front across the Pacific and European theaters. Today, we remember and pay tribute to the 2,403 service members and civilians that died during the attack on our forces at Pearl Harbor and honor the extraordinary contributions that these veterans made to guide our nation through the world's darkest moments. I'd also like to offer an update on open enrollment. As of today, nearly 5.5 million signed up for healthcare through the ACA marketplace since the start of open enrollment last month, a continued record-breaking pace for enrollment in, in quality, affordable health care. The Biden administration has made expanding access to health insurance and lowering health care costs for America's families a top priority. And under their leadership, the national uninsured rate reached an all-time low earlier this year. Thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act, which congressional Republicans want to repeal, four out of five consumers can find a plan that costs $10 or less a month. Additionally, 13 million Americans will continue to save an average of 800 bucks a year on coverage. Open enrollment continues until January 15, 2023 for states using the healthcare.gov platforms. Americans without health insurance or those who need to renew it for 2023 should go to healthcare.gov between now and December 15th to ensure that their coverage begins on January 1st, 2023. We've also got some really good economic news that I know you all are excited about. Uh, gas prices have now hit their lowest level since January. The national average is $3.36 uh, bucks per gallon, down about $1.66 per gallon since June, and about 18 cents below where they were when Putin invaded Ukraine. In 11 states, the average gas price is $2.99 or less. That, that decline is saving Americans' families with two cars, about $170 a month. President Biden committed to addressing Putin's tax hike at the, at the pump, and he is doing just that. Finally, this morning, the president signed the Speak Out bipartisan legislation, uh, Speak out, out Act, I should be clear there, bipartisan legislation that will enable survivors to speak out about workplace sexual assault and harass harassment, uh, increase access to justice, and make the workplace safer for everyone. Today's bill was passed thanks to part of to the extraordinary leadership of Gretchen Carlson and other survivors and advocates, as well as Congress, Congressman Lois Frankel and Sherry Bustos and Senator Kristen Gillibrand and Mazi and Mazi Hirono. One in three women report having, sex, having faced sexual harassment in the workplace, and people of color, low-wage workers, and LGBTQI plus individuals are also disproportionately impacted. Individuals are also, I'm sorry, disproportionately impacted. The threat of legal retaliation can silence survivors while allowing predatory workplace behavior to continue unchecked. The Speak Out Act creates a critical national standard empowering survivors by prohibiting the enforcement of pre-dispute non-disclosure agreements, those are NDAs, and non-disparagement clauses in, in cases of workplace sexual assault or harassment. 
This bill builds on the ending force attribution of sexual harassment, um, sexual assault and sexual harassment act, which the president signed into law earlier this year, which made it easier for survivors of sexual assault and harassment to bring suit in court and to avoid being forced to to arbitrate their legal claims. Together, these laws help protect the safety and well-being of Americans, American workers, and make our workplaces safer, fairer, and more just. With that, oh, hi, Josh, how are you? I haven't seen you in a long time. No, you said that last time. Okay. I feel like I don't see you enough. Clearly, clearly, I miss well, you. I have a thousand questions for you. Go, go for <laughs> it. I'm just, I'm Shocker. Two subjects. OK, um, OK, Josh. On the Georgia Senate election, with uh, Senator Warnock's re-election having 51 Senate seats. What does that mean for possible changes in how the White House approaches its policy agenda and confirmation process? So let me just, I want to give you a little bit of color on the call. I know some folks uh, had some questions about, about how the call went. So Senator uh, Warnock, uh, well, first, as you know, the president called Senator Warnock last night when we got back um, from Phoenix, Arizona, uh, and, uh, and Senator Warnock thanked the president for the call, and they talked about their partnership and the importance of their continued work together in the months and years ahead. Look. Uh, what I would say to your question, Josh, about what this means for, for moving forward uh, when it comes to the president's legislative agenda, when it comes to Democrats' legislative agenda, it's that it gives us a little bit more breathing room, a little bit more ability to deliver for the American people. The president has been very clear these past almost two years that his main priority, his main objective is to make sure uh, that the American, the American uh, public, the American people, when it comes to the economy, uh, we build it from the, bottle, uh, from the bottom up, middle out, giving people of real opportunities. You see that in his economic in, in initiatives and, and priorities, his plans, when you see the bipartisan infrastructure legislation, the Infra, Infl Inflation Reduction Act, which I just mentioned at the top, and when you think about the American Rescue Plan, the first big piece of legislation that this president passed with only uh, Democratic votes, which met the moment that he walked into with an eco economy that was uh, really tanking, and he helped uh, make sure that people got shots in arms, helped the economy get back on its feet. And we've seen these successes, which in the last two to uh, two years. Again, this is going to give us a little bit more of that uh, breathing room to get things done, to continue to move uh, forward uh, with uh, what the American people want. And they were very clear in the midterms. What the American people want is they want to continue uh, the agenda that the president has had the last two years. And then, uh, secondly, on the National Defense Authorization Act, it doesn't include a military COVID vaccine mandate. Is the president's objection to removing that mandate so strong that he's willing to veto the NDA? So let me just first say, I'll answer that question, but I do want to make a few points here. So I don't want to get ahead of the process. Uh, as we know, there's the there we, we know there's a, the the uh, conference language. There's still the legislative process uh, that has to move ahead uh, on this. And so again, I'm not going to get ahead of the of the vote, or I'm not going to get ahead of the president. But every year, as you know, the uh, the NDAA has some provisions uh, we support and some we do not. And what the president's going to do is he's going to judge uh, judge this piece of legislation, this bill, uh, on its entirety uh, when that occurs. Again, there's a process moving. There's a process that's happening. And so we're going to let that happen uh, in Congress. I will note, uh, just to be very, very clear here, what we saw, what uh, what we think happened here is uh, Republicans in Congress have decided that they rather uh, rather fight against the health and well-being of our troops than protecting them. And we believe that it is a mistake what we saw, uh, what we saw happen on the NDAA as it relates to the vaccine mandate. Making sure our troops are prepared and ready for service is a priority uh, for uh, President Biden. The vaccination requirement for COVID does just that. I'll add one more thing, just a, just a little bit of a, a point, a data point here, so all of you have this. Look, before COVID vaccine existed, nearly 700 Department of Defense personnel and service members died of COVID. Almost 100 of them were active duty. And so since this past spring, there has been one death due to COVID. So vaccinations work and save the lives of our service members. So we believe that it was a mistake. Okay. I just want to go back to your um, 
comment uh, on, on breathing room that you just mm -hmm. said. If you could, with a look ahead going forward, um, lay out for us where you think you'll have the most breathing room. Um, is it specifically judicial nominees? Kind of what's the list of So of we what, have been very clear that judicial nominees is, an, is a priority for this president. That's something clearly that we want to move forward on and continue uh, continue our successes. We You've seen uh, the success of judicial nominees as it relates to this president's uh, first two years, making sure that uh, we have put forth uh, a historic amount of, of black women uh, to, uh, to, um, you know, to judgeships, and so the president wants to continue uh, to do that. Our nominations as well, moving forward on that. So that is something that we have said. Those are clearly priorities. Uh, don't want to get too far ahead of what the president uh, is wants to do or what that legislative process is going to continue to have those conversations, uh, congressional leadership. Uh, but again, look, we saw we saw the results. All of you reported on the results of the of the midterms, and you know the, the you know Democrats and not just Democrats, pardon me, but the American people were very very clear on what they wanted to see. They wanted they want uh, Congress and the president to continue to fight for women's rights and our freedoms. They want to protect our democracy. Uh, they don't want our Social Security or our Medicare to be uh, put on the chopping blocks, and that's what Republicans officials were putting out there as their plan. Uh, uh, and so we're going to continue to deliver for the American people. What you saw Senator Warnock do and what you saw Democrats uh, do this past, uh, this past election is run on the president's agenda, run on a, an agenda that was successful. Uh, and uh, and so uh, that's what uh, this was a success for Democrats, but also uh, for President Biden. Why not lay out that agenda now, given that the results are in? So if you could walk us through the thought process behind that, when we then might hear the president, are we going to hear some kind of speech on that? And then just quickly, um, what what is sort of the thought process in terms of bipartisan agreement? The president, after the midterms, had said that working with a divided chamber would be. Um, might, life for Democrats more difficult. Does he still believe that in what areas where they're where Can you, you say that pursue? last part again? Uh, that the president had said that uh, a divided chamber in the Congress would, would uh, make the reality for Democrats in Washington working more difficult. It would be tougher to do your job, get, get things passed if you don't have a house. Um, what going forward, what kind of where, where are the areas of bipartisanship that you could? So look, there's so many areas of, of bipartisanship that the president sees. When it comes to delivering for the American people uh, on the economy, on health care, on issues that they truly care about, we can do that in a bipartisan way. Uh, there's no there's no reason that that couldn't uh, be done. You know, we talk about the government funding. Last year, it was done in a bipartisan way. This year, it should be done in a bipartisan way because you, when you think about what's in the what's what the specifics are in that funding, you think about public education, you think about public health, right? You think about our national security. All of those things are not partisan issues. Uh, but I will also say, when the president had his meeting uh, with the Big Four, the the um, uh, Republican and Democratic leadership on Congress in Congress uh, just last week. He was very clear. You saw the readout, and you heard me say this as well, which is, uh, you know, this past uh, almost two years, there were more than 200 pieces of legislation that the president signed into law that were bipartisan. Uh, that is so it is possible to get things done. The president was in Phoenix, Arizona. We, he talked about the Chips and Science Act. That was done in a bipartisan way to bring back jobs to the U.S., manufacturing jobs in, in the U.S. And under this presidency, more than 700,000 manufacturing jobs have been created. So there's ways to do that. The bipartisan infrastructure legislation, a historic piece of legislation that's going to fix our infrastructure uh, and uh, and our roads or you know our roads or tunnels or bridges and that was done in a bipartisan way so there's many ways that we can do that the president is willing uh, to reach across the aisle as he has been during out his, throughout his career to get things done for the American people again I don't want to get ahead of the, the president uh, I will let him uh, you know speak to that when the time comes what I'm saying is the president uh, is going to continue to have con uh, conversations with congressional leaders uh, he did just last week just a, just a week ago or so um, and uh, he wants to make sure that we can continue doing, uh, moving the country forward uh, in a way that helps the, the American people. Uh, thanks, Kareem. So the, the deadline for Biden to decide whether to declassify thousands of documents related to the assassination of John F. Kennedy is looming. It's December 15th. 
Um, is that declassification still on track, um, or will the administration seek to extend? <coughs> uh, I don't have a, an update for you on that particular uh, question on declassif declassification of those documents. Uh, once we once we have more to share, we certainly will. I don't have anything to preview at this time. Uh, one more thing. Um, I wonder if you can preview some of the remarks Biden's going to make tonight at the vigil for victims of gun violence. And he's spoken frequently on the campaign trail in public about the desire for an assault weapons ban. Does, is that out of the water now that there's divided government? Uh, I, well, there's 51 sen for Democratic senators now. Uh, so that, that matters. Like I said, it'll make things a little bit easier. But yes, to your point, uh, is a divided government. Uh, but look, far too many Americans are losing their lives and loved ones to gun violence. We are seeing communities being broken up, families being destroyed because of gun violence. And so tonight, the president will join survivors and families impacted by gun violence to deliver remarks at the 10th annual National Vigil for all victims of gun violence. Uh, the vigil is a service of mourning and loving remembrance for all who have fallen a victim to the ongoing epidemic of gun violence in America. As you all know, uh, as you just mentioned, uh, a little bit about the, the assault weapons ban, but also the president signed the most significant gun safety legislation in 30 years uh, this summer, but it, it feel, he feels it's not enough. He believes that we need to do more, and he's been very vocal about that uh, these past several months. He continues to call for an assault weapons ban to be passed by the, by the Senate and sent it to his desk. So he's never going to stop showing up. He's never going to stop talking about this. He believes that speaking up and making sure that the American public is aware what his priorities are is important uh, as well. And look, and, and fighting for uh, the scourge of gun violence that is killing our kids, uh, leaving holes in our families, and tearing up uh, communities, uh, tearing our communities apart. So he's going to keep continue to speak to that. In the wake of the midterms, the president's traveled to two states that were critical to 2020, but also where Democrats did quite well in Michigan and Arizona. Should we expect a trip to Georgia anytime soon? Oh, um, don't have anything to preview at this time on any trips uh, that the president will be having in the next couple of weeks. Uh, you know, of course, we've been to Georgia many times during even this uh, presidency and always look forward to going back, but don't have anything to preview at this time. Can I ask on the, the funding negotiations, uh, Republican Leader McConnell yesterday made pretty clear that they hadn't made any significant headway on any of the major issues, including the top line, uh, and said that would likely lead to a CR if it didn't change soon. How, how does the president view his role in these negotiations? I understand the critical role Shalanda plays. I understand there are uh, House Democrats, Senate Democrats, House Republicans, Senate Republicans. Given the timeline here, what does the president view as his role, his necessity here? Yeah, well, look, just last week, as I was mentioning, when he met he met with uh, congressional leadership, uh, that was part of the readout that we provided to all of you, is how important it is to get this government funding done. Uh, he believes, and I just stated this moments ago, he believed that we were able to do this in a bipartisan way last year, and we should be able to do that in a bipartisan way this year. We have the time to get that done. And to your point, yes, our OMB director, Shalanda Young, is, is leading the process. She was she knows how to get this done. She knows how to reach across the aisle uh, to, get, to make sure that uh, we deliver for the American people. These are not partisan issues. These are real critical uh, issues that we're talking about. We're talking about the different specifics of the government funding that are, matter to the American people. So, like I said, the president spoke to leadership last week. It was part of uh, the readout that we provided to all of you, and uh, he'll continue to have those conversations. Just real quick, is the administration at this point proposed to any CR into next year? Look, I'm not going to get ahead of what's happening right now. Uh, um, uh, in Congress, what we believe is that, uh, you know, we should be able to have an omnibus uh, uh, bill uh, like we have done in the past, and it should be bipartisan, and we have enough time uh, to get that done. Uh, thanks, Green. Is the White House following the events in Germany in which 25 members of a far-right group were detained for planning to overthrow the state, and is the U.S. offering any help or intelligence gathering on that? So uh, we applaud the German uh, government and its law enforcement and special forces for their diligence in combating violent uh, extremism and keeping their citizens safe and their government facilities secure. We would refer you to the German government specifically and law enforcement authorities for questions about the investigation uh, uh, specifically on that. We remain in contact and close contact with our government counterparts and are standing uh, by to assist if asked. 
Uh, also on foreign policy, are, is the White House concerned about Belarus moving troops? Um, is there concern that that might be the opening of another front in Russia's war against Ukraine? So look, uh, you know, um, we have been very clear about um, about what is what Russia is doing, right? We've been very clear that um, it is important to stand with the Ukrainian people. Uh, it is important to um, uh, for us to help the Ukrainian people fight for their democracy, fight for their freedom, and that's what. Uh, we have done. That's what the president has done, along with uh, our partners and allies, and bringing NATO together uh, in a historic way. And so that's what we're going to continue to do. And we're going to be very clear and loud about that, and and say uh, and say that we applaud what Ukrainian what the Ukraine Ukrainian people are doing. And when it comes to what we're seeing from Russia, they are they are uh, you know they are uh, the ones who are attacking another country. They are the ones who are stepping on on their uh, on their freedoms, on their democracy, and we have to continue to call that out, and we have to continue uh, to make sure that we're providing the assistance to Ukrainian people to continue to fight. So we've been very clear on that. We've been very clear on uh, it's important that folks stand on the right side of history on this when it comes to fighting our, for democracy. And uh, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. But on Belarus specifically. So don't have look. Don't have anything specifically on that. I have not seen the reporting on Belarus. Uh, it would not be surprising, as I remember you all reported on Belarus very early on in this, uh, in in this in this uh, continuous war. Uh, but again, the president has been very clear. Like we, it is important to stand with the with the Ukrainian people as they're fighting for uh, their lives, as they're fighting for their democracy and their freedom, and uh, being on that side of history uh, is 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 incredibly important. Thanks, Karine. I want to follow up on the vigil that the president's going to attend tonight. In the wake of the mass shootings in Colorado and Virginia, the president said he wanted to revive his push for the assault weapons ban. Where does that stand? Is he going to push for that in the lane So, yeah. look, I ver, just, just to speak a little bit to why the president continues to talk about this, and I talk, spoke about it just a moment ago. Uh, he believes that it is incredible, incredibly important as president for him to continue to speak to this, for him to continue to put this uh, at the forefront, the importance of getting the assault bans weapon, a uh, weapons ban. And so, and he, he is grateful for the bipartisanship that we saw just m months ago on getting that uh, gun reform uh, to really fight gun violence, something that we hadn't seen in 30 years, but he believes we need to do more. Uh, and he, it's not just the legislation, it's also the work that he has done throughout his administration. The President put out uh, the Safer America Plan, which is a roadmap for additional actions needed to reduce gun, gun, uh, gun crime. As part of that, the President continues to call, again, for uh, assault weapons ban to be passed by the Senate, and he believes that is one of the best actions we can take to reduce gun violence and save lives, and the President feels very strongly about that. And whether it, it's in the next three weeks or beyond, the president is not going to take uh, his foot off the off, off the gas pedal on on getting that done. Uh, you know, again, he's going to continue to talk about that. Uh, he's going to continue to make sure that it is a priority uh, for his administration uh, and be very clear with Congress on how important it is to move forward with this. When we saw the assault. Uh, weapons ban uh, in place uh, 30 years ago uh, in 1994 when the president was very much a big part of getting that done, we did see uh, crimes go down as it relates to, uh, to, to that particular bill. And, uh, and once it sunset, 10 years later, we saw an increase. So he's going to continue to fight for it. And, and I, I hear what you're saying in terms of the timing. I guess part of me is curious about the, the mechanism. I, I had a chance to interview incoming Congressman Maxwell Frost, who, of course, made it a key part of his platform to um, fight against gun violence. And he call, has called for a vote on the assault weapons ban in the Senate, saying, quote, I think it's important to put it up for a vote even if it doesn't pass, because it gets people on the record. And I wonder if the President shares that perspective, that it is worth putting it on the floor for a vote, the even president, if you don't have enough votes. I, I, I understand. I understand what um, what is being laid out and said to me, look, the President believes that we need to get something done. 
that's what he wants. He wants he to make sure. In the Senate. Look, he wants to see he wants to see uh, the Senate get it done. He wants to see uh, obviously a vote in the Senate. Uh, he wants to make sure he wants to see the assault weapons ban get done, and he believes that is what's going to save the lives uh, of uh, of families and communities across the country. Ask you about the um, anti-Semitism forum. The second gentleman said today there is an epidemic of hate facing our country. Let me be clear: words matter. People are no longer saying quiet parts out loud; they are screaming them. Obviously, very powerful words. I'm wondering what, if any, actions the White House, the President, uh, thinks can and should be taken to deal with this issue. Look, the President has been very clear. Um, you know, I was talking to him about this earlier today, and uh, look, he said he said what I've always said here is silence is complicity, right? And that is true. And we need to speak out uh, against hate, bigotry, anti-Semitism, and Holocaust denial are disgusting and have no place in America, period. Let's not forget, uh, in 2017, the president uh, put out, uh, put forth an op-ed uh, that, that talked about what he saw in Charlottesville and the hatred, the anti-Semitism that we saw, that, we, that you all all reported on. And so he has been consistent on calling that out, talking about the soul of our nation, talking about how important it is uh, to really speak out against this type of hate that we're seeing. Given how critical it is to the president, why didn't he attend? Today, why did you make remarks? Look, here's the thing that I want to be really clear about. Again, I just talked about 2017, how the president has been out front. He was out front as a former vice president. He put out, again, an op-ed being out front on this critical issue and what we were seeing, and someone lost their lives, right? Someone lost their life on that day. <laughs> Uh, when he decided to run uh, in, 20, in 2019 to be president, he talked about the soul of a nation. He talked about the increase of hate and what he was seeing. And there's been many times at this podium and many times this president himself has called out the bigotry, the anti-Semitism that we have been seeing, and he'll continue to do that. Uh, I talked about this, how important it is for the second gentleman because of his, his historic role uh, and how he belongs to that, to the Jewish community, and how important it was for him. Uh, and again, he represents the administration. He is the second gentleman. Uh, but look, just a couple of things I do want to lay out what we have done. At September's United We Stand Summit, our administration announced a series of actions and commitments to take on hate fueled violence. President Biden has established the first uh, ambassador level special envoy to monitor and combat anti Semitism and appointed the re 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 renowned Holocaust expert uh, to the role. So these are actions that he has taken uh, most recently in the last uh, almost two years. And I think that shows his commitment uh, to this issue, that shows his commitment in fighting anti Semitism and fighting hate. The Biden Thanks, Go ahead. Go ahead. Thanks, Corrine. Uh, Senator Manchin now has an amendment to the NDAA. He's hoping to advance on the floor uh, for his permitting reform provisions. Does the White House support and continue to support the effort at this stage? So the, the president believes we must pass the permitting reform bill so that the, that the U.S. can realize uh, the benefits of the historic investments in the Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure law. He supports permitting reform. As I said just a couple days ago, we will continue to work with Congress and find the best path forward so we can enact a bill, enact this bill. So it is a priority for this president. If I could just follow up to your answer to Josh's question, and I think John Kirby said the same thing this morning, that it was a mistake for the provision rescinding the vaccine mandate to be included in the NDAA. But specifically, Josh asked you if, if the president would veto the NDAA if the provision <laughs> remains. Is, is the president threatening to veto the NDAA? I, I just answered that question, which was there's a process in place. We talked about the conference language. There's a legislative process that has to go, th go, th go forward, right? I'm not going to get ahead of votes. I'm not going to get ahead of what that process is going to look like. Uh, the president's going to look at uh, the NDAA in its entirety uh, and make his judgment on that. And I'm not leaning any way here. I'm just laying out the facts of how this works. Thanks, Frank. Following up on um, Kristen's question about the assault weapons ban push from the president, he said specifically on Thanksgiving that he was going to count the votes to see if there were enough votes to do anything during the lame duck. Has he counted the votes? Has he made any determination? Look, I don't have any determination uh, f to share with you at this time. What I can say is the president is committed uh, and believes that we need to get an assault weapons ban. 
He has been very, very clear about that. He is uh, he's appreciative of what Congress was able to do with the with the the the, um, the piece of legislation that got passed just a couple of months ago on making sure that we deal with uh, gun gun violence in our communities. That was something that we hadn't seen in 30 years. But he believes we need to go further. Again, I exp I you know I tried to explain a little bit about his thinking uh, about how he, why he continues to talk about this. He believes it's important for him as the president of the United States to have this conversation, to put this uh, at the forefront and continuing to do this because we're seeing what gun violence is doing uh, and how it's destroying our communities and what it's doing to our you communities. to make a determination on votes in the lame duck? Uh, look, look there's, there's a lot happening, right, in the next couple of weeks. I just said whether this happens in the next three weeks or beyond, uh, this is, continues to be a priority for this president. Is the administration following the situation in Peru where the president is, says he is going to dissolve the Congress before a third impeachment vote? Do you have any response or comment to that? So so we've, we've seen the reports, and I, I believe the NSC, the NSC team is looking uh, at that. Uh, of course, this is a developing developing news, and I, I don't have anything to share on that today. But again, we've seen the reports, uh, and NSC is certainly looking at this. Yeah, JJ. Um, Georgia elections official Brad Raffensperger said yesterday that he'd like to see Georgia um, lawmakers take a look at uh, ranked choice voting or runoff alternatives. Does the White House have any thoughts on the structure of state elections or whether archaic election systems need to be updated or changed? So don't have any uh, position from the White House to share on this today. Um, of course, I've read the reports. I just don't have anything to share at this time. Karine, okay, sorry to push again one more time to follow up on Kristen and Catherine. I hear what you're saying that the president has always and will always push for a ban on assault rifles. I think the difference is that he himself went a step further and said in response to whether that would happen during the lame duck session, he said, I got to make that assessment as I get in and start counting the votes. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, I know you said a determination yeah. hasn't been made, but has he started counting the votes? Are there conversations between him and lawmakers about where they stand? So look, the president has always been very clear to lawmakers that he has conversations with how important it is to get the assault weapons ban done. That is something that has been continuous uh, and that has happened across uh, his administration, across a couple of months of his administration. That, that will never stop. Uh, you know, I, I get the question, and I just answered, kind of answered it and said, don't have a determination for you at this time. But what I can say is, uh, it doesn't matter if it's the next three weeks or beyond, the president is going to continue to fight for this, right? This is something that is very personal to him. This is something that he worked on uh, as a senator and got done. Uh, and let's not forget, you know, we were able to see a, a, a gun reform or, uh, legislation or gun violence, uh, a, a piece of legislation that's now into law get done, something that we hadn't seen in 30 years. Uh, and it was done in a bipartisan way. So the, person, the president's going to continue to fight for this. He believes that getting this done, getting the assault weapons ban, is going to save lives uh, and is going to, uh, is going to save uh, communities. And so he's going to put this at the forefront, continue to talk about it, uh, and, uh, and work very hard to get that done. Question to him was specifically about these next three weeks. I, so I hear I you, and I, I actually I just answered so like, that question. <laughs> can you just tell us whether that process has started to count I, the I, votes. I look I don't have a I don't have anything else to preview okay. for you or if that process has occurred or happened I hear what you're saying I, I am telling you it is a priority for this president okay. uh, he's going to continue to fight for this whether it's in the next couple of weeks right of this of this uh, uh, of this legislative session as we're you know coming to the end of the year or beyond uh, and what I can tell you for sure what I can tell you for sure is he has prioritized this it is a it is important uh, for him to get this done and uh, and again it could be the next three weeks or beyond we are going to uh, we are going to work very hard uh, to get to deliver this for the American people and one more on um, uh, the the uh, new margin in the Senate now that the vice president won't have to break the tie as often um, in theory and she has more flexibility in her schedule and time. Will that impact her portfolio, travel schedule at all? I, I mean, I don't believe so, no.
Yeah, I would reach out to her team uh, specifically, but I don't believe so. The president. Let me just say, the vice president has been a great partner of the president this past uh, two years. Uh, you know, the successes that they both have had in the uh, clearly Biden Harris administration on getting uh, things done for the American people when it comes to the economy, when it comes to lowering costs, when it comes to fighting uh, inflation, uh, and that is something that we're going to continue to do. We just talked about uh, the gun violence reform legislation that was passed just a couple. Of, uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, all of that was done in partnership uh, with the Vice President, and he appreciates uh, all the work that she has done on, on, on these issues. Thank you, Crane. Um, the White House and the President were very vocal about Georgia's uh, new election law when it was signed in March of 2021, and the big argument from the White House was that it would suppress voting. Um, but there was record turnout in the primary, there was record turnout in the general, record turnout in the runoff, in early voting, absentee ballots, and in-person voting. So is the DOJ going to drop their lawsuit against the state? I can't speak to DOJ's actions and what they're going to do. The president, though, called it um, Jim Crow in the 21st century and a blatant attack on the Constitution. So does he still see it that way? I'll say this. I'm not going to speak to the Department of Justice uh, legal uh, actions. That's something for them to, uh, to speak to. Uh, what I can say, and uh, not not going to get into specifics of your question, but you guys, you all have reported this that there was uh, suppression. Uh, that uh, that that we saw that uh, throughout uh, through that throughout the the Georgia election. So that is something that was been reported on. So I leave it to those reports. Uh, but look, even with that, the American people came out. They came out in historic fashion, fashion uh, uh, to make their voices loud and clear. Uh, when it comes to a democracy, when it comes to protecting our democracy, when it comes to uh, making sure that uh, we're protecting our economy, protecting Social Security and Medicare, this is something that uh, the American people spoke very loud and clear. And they did that uh, because of the success that the president has had on his legislative agenda, because of the of what the president has been able to deliver, because of what Democrats has been able to do, and making sure we had a sharp message uh, for the American people uh, to see the contrast. Right? Republicans wanted to put Social Security and Medicare on the chopping block. That's what they wanted to do. That was their plan. Uh, and, you know, people have said, I've heard some of your colleagues uh, say uh, earlier this morning that stunning, it was a stunningly bad cycle for Republican senators. Uh, and a lot of that is because of their agenda, is because they embodied the ultra-MAGA ideas. And uh, even with all of that, the American public came out and uh, they put a lot of uh, that to rest, a lot of what the, pre what the Republican officials were putting forth their plan to rest. And they said it very loud and clear. We want, to, we want the special interests to pay their fair share. We want Social Security. We want Medicare to be protected. And we want women's rights to be protected as well. Just one more Thank on, you. on Twitter, Corrine. Um, the, the Twitter files have released that the company um, typically required an official or law enforcement finding that materials were hacked in order to exercise their company policy to restrict certain stories or reporting. Um, and the journalist who released the material noted that in this case, around the Hunter Biden laptop story, there was no uh, official or law enforcement finding that appeared in the material that he was given. Um, so my question to you is, did anyone from the Biden team communicate to, to Twitter that this material was um, was from, ha or this reporting stemmed from hacked materials? Are you talking about the, the campaign? It would have been the campaign or anyone around the family. Just wondering, because the, in the Twitter files release and what Matt Taibbi said, he noted that typically the company would require a law enforcement or official finding that something was hacked in order to exercise their hacked materials clause, and that they didn't, he didn't see that in what had been given to him. So wondering if it was communicated even informally by someone around uh, the president or the president's family or the campaign that this was hacked material or could have come from hacked material, given that um, there was so much concern, uh, especially after the uh, 2018 foreign interference uh, situation that that could be something that we would see in, the, in that election. So I'm, I'm wondering if there, there was that communication there surrounding the Hunter Biden laptop story. So I can't speak to decisions made uh, by uh, by the campaign from here. That is not. It, it is a political 
uh, uh, campaign, so I can't speak from that from here to that from here. I'm covered by the Hatch Act, and so I'm just not going to comment on on the question that you're asking me. But what I can say more broadly is, of course, uh, it's up to these companies uh, to make their own decision about the content on their platforms and to ensure content follows uh, their own standards and policies. But I'm just not going to uh, comment on a decision that was made during the campaign. Okay. Thank you, Karine. I have two questions for you. Uh, following the explosion near the po border with Ukraine, Poland just accepted uh, Germany's offer to deploy Patriot missile defense systems to <coughs> eastern Poland. But initially, the Polish government said that Patriots should be delivered to Ukraine. So can you comment on the deployment? And I'm wondering if the president uh, sees a need to transfer Patriots to Ukraine, either by NATO or the, or the US, considering continued uh, Russian attacks on civilian inf infrastructure in Ukraine. So to your first question, so we would leave it to uh, Germany and Poland uh, to speak about the specifics of what is being provided. That's for them, their own governments to speak to. Uh, as a general matter, we welcome allied efforts to bolster NATO's uh, collective defenses. And uh, to your to your last question about uh, NATO and, and how this could be provided, look, we're in close uh, close uh, contact with Ukrainians uh, about their security assistance needs, uh, as you've heard us speak to uh, many times from this podium, and have been working to provide Ukraine with air defense systems to help them protect uh, their country. But I, I, again, I don't have anything to to preview today for you today on, on this on that particular issue. Well, uh, Hungarian pre uh, Prime Minister Viktor Orbán said recently that Hungary will uh, ratify Sweden's and Finland's. Uh, membership uh, in NATO early next year. Uh, does the president have any update from Turkey, which it looks like will be the only holdout? So, look, uh, I would refer you to the Turkish government to speak about their own position. It's certainly not something that we're going to do from here. Uh, but what I can say is that we have been a strong supporter of Finland and Sweden's applications for a NATO membership and work with the Senate to uh, move quickly to ratify their applications. And so we have welcomed the, the rapid ratifications by our allies, and we urge all remaining allies to compete, complete uh, their own ratification process as quickly uh, as possible. Okay. Thanks, Green. Um, are you guys confirming reporting from Bloomberg today that the president will travel to Mexico and meet with the Mexican president on January 9th? and hold a trilateral with Lopez Obrador and Trudeau on January 10th for the North American we're still working through the plans. Uh, uh, nothing has changed uh, since I was last asked this question, uh, and we'll let you know if we have anything more to share. And on the U.S.-Africa Leader Summit, um, are there any details you can share about any bilateral meetings he's holding? Um, and given the focus of competition with China and the national security strategy, do you expect it to be a a big topic at next week's summit. So I don't have any bilateral meetings to share at this time on on the uh, Africa Summit uh, Leader Summit that's happening next week, as you just stated. We and I mentioned this a little bit at the end of our uh, of the briefing on Monday. We've invited 49 African heads of state to Washington D.C. for a three-day summit. Uh, to highlight how uh, the U.S. and African nations are strengthening our partnerships to advance uh, uh, shared, shared priorities. Uh, the summit reflects the U.S. strategy towards sub-Saharan Africa, with emphasi which emphasizes the critical importance of the region to meet this uh, era's defining challenges. Uh, we will have more, as we do normally, uh, background calls and more to share uh, on, uh, and on what is to be expected during those th that three-day summit. Thanks, Karen. Um My colleague had asked you on Monday about the drug shortages question, and just wanted to follow up on that. Is this something that the president has been engaged on? Uh, has he been briefed on medicine shortages? So let me just say this uh, and uh, a little, uh, share share where we are. Um, so as I've said, as you mentioned on Monday, I was asked by your colleague, I believe Ben. Uh, the administration is closely monitoring for the possibility of any national shortages. Uh, medicine shortages are are not uncommon and, and is closely monitored and led by FDA and HHS, who are experts on this, right? This is their focus. Health officials are in close uh, communication with manufacturers around these medicines. While we cannot force a manufacturer to make more of any drug, uh, the conversations have been focused on understanding their supply and, pr and production levels, as well as, as if there 
if, if there are any needs that we can assist with to ensure steady supply. We stand ready to help if there is a need. Uh, as Also as part of these conversations, FDA and HHS are in touch with manufacturing associates who continue to tell the public that they are seeing strong supply chains uh, for these products. So that work, again, is ongoing. And as a reminder, we stand ready to help states and jurisdictions as they face the confluence of winter illness. But also importantly, we are aggressively pushing everyone to get their flu and COVID shots. I said this on Monday. It is important to do. That is how uh, folks are going to protect themselves and their families, especially as we're going into uh, continuing the holiday season. So we stand ready to provide resources to states like ventilators and PPE, as well as personnel to help in hospitals. Uh, just last week, Secretary Becerra sent a letter to the nation's governors reminding them to request those resources if they need to, if they need it. Uh, again, this is something that FDA and HHS is, is managing, but as I just stated, we are, we are ready to help uh, when needed when those requests come in. The FDA and agencies don't have much visibility into the supply chain issues. They've said that they're really dependent on the industry to give them information mm -hmm. on any yeah. issues and uh, whether there are shortages. Does the White House think it's time for the FDA to get more involved so that they can get better information from companies? Well, I just stated in my, my layout here uh, that FDA and HSS are in touch with manufacturing associates who continue to tell to tell uh, the public that they are seeing strong supply chains for these products. So that's what they're hearing. Uh, that's what we're all hearing uh, from these uh, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, associate associations. So I'll leave it, I'll leave it there. Um, but again, I would refer you to FDA and uh, HHS, as they are indeed the experts on this. Uh, but I've been very clear. You saw Secretary Becerra's letter that I just laid out. We are ready to help, and we have told uh, states to certainly ask for help if they need it, and we will be ready to act. Up on the question about whether concrete actions are expected out of today's roundtable on anti-Semitism, one of the Jewish groups that participated um, is calling for a national strategy to address the issue, but another wants uh, the president to appoint a task force charge of creating the national action. Is the administration looking at anything like uh, either of those um, proposals? So that meeting just occurred, I think, at 11 o'clock. I don't have any uh, a clear readout on what uh, on what was actually asked or talked about. I know you just laid out a few things, so we just need to go back to our teams and see how we're going to move forward. Don't want to get ahead uh, of what you know of what could be um, what could be put forward on on the next steps. Just don't want to get ahead of that. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Green. On TikTok, um, I'm going to ask you about this. so Maryland and South Dakota became the latest two states to ban TikTok on state devices. Is the federal government, is the president considering doing something here? So um, I'm not going to comment on uh, TikTok while a CFIUS, uh, the Committee on Foreign Investment in, in the United States, uh, review is ongoing, as you know, uh, to address concerns posed by this particular app. Uh, generally speaking, the Biden administration is focused on ch on challenge of certain of certain countries, uh, including chi China, seeking to leverage digital technologies and America's data in ways that present unacceptable national s security risk. But again, I'm just not going to uh, comment on on a ongoing review. Just one more on uh, President Xi is now in Saudi Arabia speaking with uh, the King and the Crown Prince. Um, there was much fanfare around his visit. Does the president feel slighted at all with his visit, which didn't get as much pomp and circumstance? I'm sorry, say that one more time. Well, so there were dances and, and, and fanfare around the visit from President Xi. Um, coming in, the president didn't get the same kind of reception uh, in Saudi Arabia. And I'm wondering if there's any slight. They met in Bali, right? With, Bali. I'm talking with, about when with, the president but, went to Saudi Arabia to visit the MBS and the Crown Prince. And so your question is? So the question is, does he feel slighted that there no, wasn't the same kind of family? No, not at all. We're going to keep moving. Go ahead. First on NDAA, something that wasn't in the uh, draft that got released today is uh, legislation to prevent a future president uh, or President Biden from uh, imposing a Schedule F and moving uh, gobs of civil servants into the accepted service. Uh, would the president, I won't ask you if he'll, he would veto 
uh, the NDA without it, but would the President support or uh, encourage adoption of an amendment uh, to prevent uh, this from happening in the future? It was one of the first things he did as President. So, look, I, I, I want to be very clear. It's still, you know, this is still in process. Um, we know, you know, one thing very clearly with this, the vac vaccine mandates, and there's still uh, a, a process going, a legislative process going. Don't want to get ahead of that. Uh, so just not going to, to comment right now as there's negotiations and, and, uh, and this piece of legislation is still moving through the, the process. Second, uh, there are reports uh, in the last day or so that the president is uh, poised to uh, appoint a new Northern Ireland envoy, uh, but that envoy would focus more on uh, economic development than uh, the Brexit uh, Northern Ireland protocol uh, border situation. Uh, if the uh, the envoy uh, will not be focused on that, does the president uh, plan to get more involved to uh, ensure uh, a smooth implementation of the Good Friday Agreement? The 25th anniversary is coming up in a matter of months. I'm, I'm not going to get ahead of of the special envoy and what their um, uh, what their purview is going to be or not be. I'm just not going to get ahead of that. Okay. Thank you, Kareen. Um, I just wanted to follow up on TikTok. I know you said you can't comment, but the U.S. business operations of the company have effectively been in question for nearly three years. And I'm wondering at what point you think there might be an outcome one way or another on whether it can operate here. I'm just not going to comment on an ongoing review that CFIUS is doing. Uh, and uh, it, it, as you know, the review is, is ongoing to address the concerns posed by the app. I'm just not going to comment from here. The FBI director has said publicly on Capitol Hill that it does pose a national cons security concern, but company executives said just yesterday they believe they're on a path to resolve those concerns. So does the administration have a view on whether those concerns can be resolved? So look, I talked about the challenges uh, that we that are, for, are certain in, that we that we're currently seeing. So I can say this more broadly uh, that we are taking the steps we can to address uh, these types of challenges. Uh, for example, President Biden issued the first ever presidential directive defining additional national security factors for CFIUS to consider in the in line with this administration's national security priorities, like protecting America's sensitive data. And last year, President Biden put forward forward an executive order to protect Americans' sensitive, sensitive data from collect, collection and utilization. The Commerce Department, with interagency support, is working to implement this EO and utilize other related authorities, and we will continue to look at other actions that we can take uh, on, this, on this matter, but I'm just not going to comment on this specific uh, issue. On, on voting rights, are there any specific elements of either the Electoral Count Act or the John Lewis Voting Rights Act that the White House is seeking? to add on to any year-end spending bill? Can you say the first part of your question? On, on voting rights. Voting rights has obviously been a huge priority of this administration, and there's a suggestion that there could be some uh, type of voting rights push here in the final weeks of the year, that some elements of existing legislation could be added on to a year-end spending bill. Has the White House been discussing this with leadership? So I, I, I've spoken to this a little bit about the, about the importance of um, of uh, the president supporting uh, the electoral, um, the electoral piece, uh, I don't have anything else to share on that. We're going to let Congress continue to negotiate and move forward with how they're moving uh, uh, the next couple of weeks. But don't have anything specific. I haven't seen any language or anything specific about what you're asking on voting rights and others. All right, All right. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Why were some members of the press corps not invited to the?